I know, my rant is over. <laughs> Let me get my water. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have to do it. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start uh, from, this, from an older book um, called Two Tables Over. Uh, it's a collection of coffee shop poems written in coffee shops because, you know, what's a poet without the cliche of writing in coffee shops? And uh, so I want to begin tonight with a poem from this book called The Sign. She comes in, tanned, tight jeans, bleach blonde hair down the back, blue eyes and too much makeup with a baby on her hip. And I decided already what this poem was going to be about. When she sits down across from what looks to be her father and begins to sign with her one free hand. He smiles and signs back, hands rolling effusively in that soundless poetry. Their gazes trade loves back and forth. The baby's eyes glow in the wave and trickle of mom's fingers that must look like birds close enough to touch. And the tresses of my preconceptions begin to buckle and the edges of my prejudice begin to crumble like dry toast because I have made a mistake. And I want to apologize, walk over, tell her, but I don't know the sign for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick flurry of uh, really short poems. Um, I have a, there's a book, this is my newest book, it's called Less is More, More or Less. And it's a book, it's a little five by seven, it's smaller, and the, the reason for the book's size is quite specific, and that it was written as a result of a challenge, and that is that no poem in this, it's a five by seven page, and no poem in the book can be longer than a single five by seven page, so that's it. It has to fit on one page or it doesn't go in. This came about, by the way, from a quote from one of my favorite poets, William Stafford, a great poet. He was the Poet Laureate of Oregon and then U.S. Poet Laureate as well. This is from a poem of his called By a River in the Osage County. You don't need many words if you already know what you're talking about. <laughs> now, this sounds more like a threat, actually, than a suggestion, but, uh, you know, what do you do? So, the book's broke, it's in four chapters. The first chapter in the book is called But Enough About Me. And it comes, it begins with a quote from Tony Hoagland, one of my favorite poets. I think narcissism is the system that means the most to me. <laughs> Condolence. I turned 48 this day, so 49 and 365 more. And yes, you know you're starting to look at when the birthday jokes of your better friends sound softer this year. <laughs> Maybe one of them lets a heavy hitter slip while averting his gaze to your whole grain cake with only a few candles because of the fire code. <laughs> but mostly though, they are all so sorry that this is happening to you. <laughs> all right. This is for all <clears throat> male artists in the room. <laughs> It's called The Question. I remember it well, and the way it loomed as some dark guarantee over the lowered brow of every father of every girl I ever dated. Well, yeah, but what do you really do? <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, so the second chapter in this book is devoted to coffee shop scenery as well. Um, it's called a Parliament of Owls. I love the, you know, the, the names for gatherings of animals. And, you know, I've always loved Murder of Crows. I did not know that it was a Parliament of Owls. Mm -hmm. How fantastic is that? And it just sounds like a coffee shop to me. Here's a coffee shop poem. It's called Local Star. He's still as good as he ever was. That's why he's still where he is. <laughs> Hippies. 
The real ones have lower back pain now and ponytails hanging by only a few gray threads. They've had to switch to the Velcro sandals lately because of rheumatoid arthritis. And though they remember some of the main principles of the 60s revolution, they've stopped for coffee now on the side streets in Taos and seem to be having a hell of a time getting up from their seats. <laughs> I read that poem. There's a wonderful little bookstore in Taos. Have any of you been there? It's called Moby Dickens. Has anybody ever been to Moby Dickens? It's a two-story old house in Taos. And I did a reading and I read that and nobody, it's not even a smile. I was like, come on, you gotta, come on. You all know it's you. We have to have a sense of humor about the whole thing. I mean, come on. And nobody, no, it's just a stone quiet. Here's one, uh, my wife Ashley's here. It's called I Loan Together, and it, the spelling is kind of important. It's small case I, capital L. So I loan, I loan together. The other night, over a quiet dinner at the snack bar on South Congress, my wife and I became those people sucked into the narcotic glow of iPhones. <laughs> Talking, not quite to each other. Smiling, not quite at each other. And it lasted less than a minute. But I'm still, days later, sad about it. <laughs> the third chapter in the book is, uh, the first thing they teach you in creative writing class is that you should never write poems about poets and poetry and poems. So I devoted an entire chapter to it. And the chapter's called Ars Poetica, Poems and Their Problems. And it begins with a quote from a uh, Oklahoma Native American uh, poet, activist, and actor, a guy named Richard Ray that I really love and respect. He's a great guy. And he says this about poets. I, this is one of my favorite quotes. Just because people don't understand you, it doesn't mean you're a poet. <laughs> Editor. I submit to you this poem that might, I am afraid, make sense to some of your readers. And only because I thought they might enjoy the break, a snow day we could call it, from the rather demanding leaves of severe profundity that you normally supply us. <laughs> and that we do at least understand is for our own good. <laughs> Remember, if you cut back on animal fat and sugar, ride bike regularly, work hard every day at improving your craft, and eventually receive awards, prizes, and titles recognizing your efforts, many people, even some who were once your friends, will resent the hell of it. <laughs> the world of the arts. My dad, um, on this chapter called, you know, Poetic Pro Poems and Their Problems, my dad was a pastor for 50 years. Um, I grew up a Baptist preacher's kid. It says, I've, I've gotten a lot of help and it's okay now. And I've gotten counseling and things are going a lot better now. But my dad had, uh, that, that, I was just kidding. My dad's a great guy. I love my dad. He's, he's a great guy. Okay. Um, but he had a poetic problem that he faced every now and then. And that for 50 years he had to do funerals. Now, he's retired now, but he's having to do more funerals, which is kind of a sad you know, byproduct. And, but he ha every once in a while he got called on to do that funeral. Um, and I watched him struggle with it for years because he was dealing with what he couldn't say. And so I wrote a poem for my dad that solved the problem for him. It's called Eulogy for a Bastard. <laughs> We gather here today under a dark sky and certain sense of disorientation to scratch our heads and armpits as one of us offers a careful rendering of disingenuous words over one of God's few regrets. <laughs> Funny, I, my dad actually read that poem long after retirement, and I loved his, he was a man of few words, and I loved his comment. He goes, hmm, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, all right. 
And then I'm gonna I'm gonna read one more of the short ones here and turn it back over to Jenna uh, for a bit. And this one is called uh, Manna. I don't know if any of you remember. There's a story a while back. Uh, the poem is dedicated to Vedran Smailovich, who is known as the cellist of Sarajevo. And basically, here's the fast version of the story. It was late in, late in the war. He was uh, he was a cellist in the, local, in the Sarajevo Symphony, and he was standing at his second story window up, uh, window of his apartment one afternoon, and there was a bread line on the sidewalk across the street from him. And as he was standing out the window looking out, a bomb went off in the middle of the bread line, killed 23 people immediately, injured many many others. And because it was late in the war, something in him snapped. And he went to his closet, put on his full symphonic regalia, right down to the bow tie, leather shoes, and the coat, and the, the tails, tucks, and grabbed his cello and bow in one hand and a plastic chair from his kitchen table in the other, went down the stairs, across the street, and set his chair next to the bomb crater while bullets and bombs were still flying and going off. Think, imagine for a moment that this was before cleanup had even started. And he began to play. Manna for Vedran Smilovich. God is stingier than we give him credit for. He can't just throw the stuff around. We take it for granted, like Israelites. But on rare occasions, we hear it falling, as in the gut strings and bow of the cellist of Sarajevo playing Albinoni's Adagio in G minor. In the rubble and burned out ruin of the National Library, bullets and bombs, the only choir singing in the broken air of the shattered stage behind him. <laughs> 